Snow falls, cars slide, people blame CDOT. Repeat. Southwest gets warned not to skimp on refunds and compensation. One of Colorado's largest polluters will shut down temporarily, clearing the air and increasing gas prices. A look at how the state plans to roll out universal pre-K without enough teachers. And a mother searches for the woman who helped her son, who was living on the streets at the time of his death. Don't know her name. I've been trying to get a hold of her. Um, I just wanted to thank her. She's hoping someone watching tonight might know something. All that is next. It's a wet snow. You know what I mean. Did you shovel it? It was clearly rain disguised as snow and so much of it. This is now the eighth wettest December day on record in Denver. It doesn't drive like early winter snow either. It kind of grabs you more. People have been getting grabbed all day, even as it melts on the road and plops out of the trees. There have been road closures off and on all day long and this 20 car pileup in Thornton this afternoon. Every time we get a rock and snowfall, you'll hear the same complaints. Well, you know where I grew up, they knew how to clear the roads. CDOT's been hearing that for decades. Steve Stager's along now with that. You know, where I'm from, they knew how to clear the roads. Uh, I really am from Detroit. Tom Norton ran the transportation agency, CDOT, from 1999 to 2007 under the Republican governor, Bill Owens. He says even back in those days, he heard these complaints from the out-of-towners. He says despite the perception, there's a lot of work put into getting crews to the right places to clear the roads. He remembers during his tenure moving plow crews at one point from Craig in northwest Colorado down to Springfield in southeast Colorado, positioning them there to work on a 14-foot snow drift. Norton believes part of the problem is when people don't see plows, they don't think the work's getting done, but he says that out-of-towner perception needs some context. Snowstorms are different in Colorado than they are, say, in Chicago or Buffalo, where they're far more frequent, and he says this is really a resource issue. It's like like Buffalo. They get the storms off the lake, and Chicago dates some of that, too, and, of course, they're a lot windier there, and and they have different uh, investment in equipment and that sort of thing. You know, it's kind of hard to justify having a bunch of snow equipment that sits around, uh, you know, 90% of the time. Norton vividly remembers waking up early to ride around with jokers like me, you know, reporters on snow plows to try to inform you skeptics out there about where the work was being done. He says it's much easier these days because they've got that plow tracker online so people can see where the plows are in real time. Bottom line remains to be the resources. He says Chicago and other cities, Kyle, invest in more snow removal equipment in certain areas, knowing that they're going to get used pretty frequently compared to here, where they really only need that equipment certain times of the year, maybe once, twice a year. Uh, yeah, it's priorities, it's choices. I mean, if people if people want to enjoy New York state level taxes, then they can do like they do in Western New York, and every child is assigned to plow at birth, and it just plows a path for them for the remainder of their life. It's a very e efficient system for getting around, but it just costs a bazillion dollars. Yeah, and you know, I think a lot of people here also have this perception that like nothing's being done because they don't see it. Because well, last night two and a half hour drive back from Fort Collins. I saw a few plows out there, but when I got back, we started talking about it with people. They're like, CDOT wasn't even out. Did you see any plows? Yes, they were out there. It's just, you gotta look for them. They're getting the work done and they're working as hard as they possibly can. Yeah, there just are not as many as you see in other places. Yep. There you go. All right, Steve, thank you. Southwest is slowly transitioning from being a company that stores empty parked planes on the ground into a company that fills planes with people and then flies them around the country. More than half of Southwest flights were still canceled today, but the airline says it could be back to normal as early as tomorrow. The feds are looking into Southwest's historic meltdown in operations and also watching how it compensates stranded passengers. They should absolutely be uh, providing refunds for those flights that were canceled if passengers aren't able to fly or choose not to fly. But also things like hotels, like ground transportation, like meals, because this is the airline's responsibility. That's where things get really interesting. So traditionally, airlines have had the final say over whether they are at fault for cancellations and therefore whether or not they offer a refund. But there you heard Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who says Southwest promised in writing this year that it would expand its consumer protections. Buttigieg says the breakdown in service was not solely due to the winter storm, as indicated by the fact that other airlines were fine, which means Southwest is supposed to pony up, Buttigieg says, for transportation, hotels, and meals. 
At the local level, DIA says it is reviewing what happened with Southwest, Frontier, and United during last week's storm. Frontier and United were certainly impacted by the weather, but they did not have a, a national-level implosion like Southwest. If you look closely at the videos of the chaos at Southwest Baggage Claims, you see a pet carrier or two. A viewer named Carol did and wanted to know if there are animals stuck unattended among those thousands of unclaimed bags. Carol, good question. Southwest has foobarred plenty lately, but it does not appear that they are abandoning pets. Southwest only allows pets to travel in the cabin. They don't put pets in the cargo hold. So passengers whose flights were canceled should never have been separated from their pets. Passengers are allowed to check empty pet carriers with their luggage, though. That's probably what you've been seeing in those photos from baggage claim. Colorado's only major oil refinery is shutting down for a couple of months. So happy breathing, everyone. Uh, but we are likely to be paying more in gas prices for that time. Suncor's Commerce City Refinery says the shutdown is due to damage from the extreme weather. Of course, we should note they've also had two fires this week. The first fire at Suncor happened Christmas Eve, sent two employees to the hospital. Another fire broke out Tuesday. No one was injured. Suncor says they're inspecting and repairing the damage and will return to normal operations in phases that should happen sometime before the end of March. The refinery produces about 98,000 barrels a day, so it's crucial to our gasoline supply. It's also one of Colorado's largest polluters. AAA says we can expect higher gas prices as a result of this closure and perhaps even higher airfare out of DIA because Suncor provides the jet fuel to airlines there. Tomorrow marks one year since one of the most destructive fires in Colorado history. The Marshall Fire showed us how critical and how flawed our emergency communications are these days. People expected somebody to tell them when it was time to evacuate, and for too many, the message never arrived. Boulder County relied on social media and an opt-in alert system called Everbridge. We found that only about one in five people confirmed they got the message. Boulder County also had access to the wireless emergency alert system, WIA, which can reach all cell phones in a certain geographic area. But Boulder County hadn't finished setting it up when the fire started. Fifteen other counties in Colorado began the year without access to the WIA system. And as of now, 14 of those counties still don't have it. It was Sedgwick County in far northeast Colorado that got online and sent a WIA for a blizzard earlier this month. Boulder County has used that WIA system several times since the Marshall Fire. More people have been getting the messages, sometimes too many people. WIAs can bleed beyond the intended geographic area because of the location of cell towers or people who have older cell phones. The county's head of emergency management acknowledged to us earlier this year that bleed over those bad alerts can get frustrating. When we do WIA now and the 911 center sends that out, it's going from Berthoud down to Arvada to Brighton all the way up to Nederland, and we draw a polygon that's literally for a neighborhood in Boulder. And we can't somehow get that nailed down. Boulder County is also working on the ability to send alerts in languages other than English. That may require using a whole other app. The start of 2023 means the start of universal pre-K in Colorado. Yet the state still needs thousands more teachers. Here's Anusha Roy with that. 61,000 kids are eligible for universal pre-K. They all deserve a good education, but too often are priced out or limited by where they live and by language barriers. Based on legislation, the idea is that all four-year-olds will get a minimum of at least 10 hours of school at no cost. The program is set to launch fall of 2023. It also means the state would like to recruit 3,000 new educators by fall of 2024. 3,000 new educators during an ongoing teacher shortage. The Colorado Department of Early Childhood shared their strategy. It's a numbers game involving millions of dollars. The state set aside $50 million in grants to try and keep the existing workforce and recruit new educators. More than 3,100 people are enrolled for two free courses that can help assisted teachers become lead teachers. Nearly $21 million have been allocated for scholarships, coursework, and mentorship. There's also now an early childhood educator tax credit that more than 8,000 people are eligible for. Melissa Morris with Colorado Children's Campaign is hoping all of this will work. She helped craft the legislation for university 
universal pre-K and is also a former kindergarten teacher who has seen the difference. Mara said a good preschool education can pay dividends in the class and for kids' social skills down the line. She also said the key here is to recuperate after losing a lot of educators during the pandemic and then adding more to the workforce and inviting teachers back into the classroom. So in that first year, the state is thinking anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of families will actually participate. A big part of this conversation has to be around salaries. So the state has actually launched a pilot program to use federal funds to work with a handful of providers to start increasing teacher wages. They also want to use stimulus funding for loan forgiveness. And Mara says that all of that is great, but that there needs to be more federal dollars on a long term basis to make this sustainable and actually successful. And she said that's an issue not just here in Colorado, but across the entire country. Anusha, I feel like this has been talked about for such a long time, and now here it comes with the financial impact of it right as we have this big shakeup in the workforce. Yeah, I mean, we've seen the governor campaign on it. We saw the legislation passed. I mean, it's been decades worth of work. But what Mara said, she said, feels really different this time is that the proposed budgets is really focusing on this issue, and it's not just child care centers. It's home-based providers. She says that is a huge thing because that reaches so many more families. It also makes it very important to reach out to families, to these providers, and give that information in as many languages as possible. Mm. All right, Anusha, thank you. Coloradans voted to decriminalize some psychedelic plants, but forgiveness for people busted with mushrooms in the past, it's not magic. There are actually quite a few reasons why someone could get denied. And a mother continues her five-year search for a stranger who helped her son in his final days. Next. This week, Democratic Governor Jared Polis signed off on the statewide ballot measures approved by voters last month, including Prop 122. That's the measure to decriminalize certain psychedelics, like mushrooms. 122 also provides a pathway for people who have prior psychedelic-related convictions to get those records sealed. It's not a guarantee that's going to happen, though. People with prior convictions on charges related to possession, use, cultivation, or giving away psychedelics, they can have that record of the conviction sealed, but they have to petition a court. If a district attorney objects to the petition, it goes to a judge. The judge can then reject that record sealing request for a number of reasons, including repeat offenses. Attorneys say it's pretty similar to what we saw with the decriminalization of cannabis. One thing we have seen in uh, for marijuana is judges that are prohibitionist minded. They don't agree with the legalization. They can usually find a reason to deny a motion. Um, and it can be for something as simple as uh, writing all the necessary information, but on the wrong motion. Another complication, Prop 122 says you're only eligible for free record sealing if you have been convicted and then completed your sentence. If you're looking to seal a pre-conviction arrest record, that is a different and much more expensive process. Wet, heavy snow last night and into this morning is long gone. We're seeing those clearer skies and more mild conditions on the way for tomorrow. Right now, 23 degrees. It feels like 13 outside with winds coming in from the south-southwest at 9 miles per hour. Not a whole lot on our HD Doppler radar. Maybe some very light snow showers across portions of the high country. But overall, we're all going to be pretty dry tonight. But we do still have a lot of snow out there. So we have several avalanche warnings still in effect through midnight. High levels of danger here, 4 out of 5. So you certainly want to stay out of those backcountry areas. Now, as we go through the weekend, the high country and western slope will continue to see more snow while we stay dry in the front range and eastern plains. But we have winter storm mornings that will be in effect as well as winter storm watches. Now, all of these areas from around Friday to Monday could see anywhere from one to two feet of snow. Those winds gusting 40 to 45 miles per hour, creating that blowing snow and reducing your visibility out there. So you'll want to watch for that if you have those travel plans to go west. In the meantime, we're clear, we're calm. We're going to see those overnight lows near 15 degrees over the next couple of days as we end 
into 2022, those temperatures continuing to climb. We're seasonal tomorrow, a bit above average on Saturday while we watch for more mountain snow there. And then that precipitation moves its way eastward for the start of 2023. We're going to see another rain change into snow kind of day. So look for on Sunday what we saw last night. And then that lingers until early Monday before we dry out midweek. A stranger's kindness still resonates five years later. What would it mean to you to be able to talk to this person? It would mean an awful lot to me. It would mean an awful lot to me. A mom tells us about her search to find the woman who helped her son in his time of need. Next. Jason Govin died on the streets of Denver five years ago, but he was not forgotten, not in the last few months of his life, when a mystery woman would bring him food and coffee. And he's not forgotten now by his mother, Candace, who is determined to find that woman and offer her her thanks. Candace Govan, who lives in Rhode Island, spoke with our photojournalist, Mike Grady. Tell me about Jason. He was an excellent, excellent artist. He copied Salvador Dali. That was his idol. That's my son, Jason. There's a picture above my head. Can you see it all right? Yeah, I see it. Okay, well, that's Jason. He had started um, picking up a bad habit. He started drinking. So he became homeless. It was December 26th, 2017. And I walked in the house and my husband tell, told me, you better sit down. And he said, well, they, they found Jason the day after Christmas or in an alley, I guess it was in an alley near a dumpster. And uh, he had died from hypothermia. There was a woman who was coming to feed him and give him coffee. I guess she worked there in the office building next door. So it was probably downtown somewhere. Yes. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It was downtown. Yes. I see in my note here that it was between Lincoln and Sherman Street. Yes. Yes. So that's what I've been trying. I don't know her name. I've been trying to get a hold of her. Um, I just wanted to thank her. I wanted to tell her a little bit about him. What would it mean to you to be able to talk to this person? Who you knew? It would mean an awful lot to me. It would mean an awful lot to me. I'm just hoping that somebody sees us and thinks, hey, there's somebody out there I know that's always on that corner. I want to give that person something. If you have any idea who might have helped Jason, please email us at next at ninenews.com and we'll get you in touch with his mom. Back with your feedback next. It's a sign that some people still are not over the whole Southwest ruined Christmas thing. This was a sign that a viewer named Sophia spotted up in Winter Park. Uh, Thanks for nothing, Southwest Airlines. Hashtag you suck. Okay, not sure if they're coming or going after a canceled flight or if they just want to advertise some dislike of Southwest, but that is pretty blunt. Keep sending signs to us next at 9news.com. Margarita writes in to say, I think Colorado does a very good job of cleaning snow on the ground. Margarita says, I'm from Queens, New York. It was hell getting around. I imagine it probably was snow plows in the city. Uh, Contrasting views on the quality of the program, as always, right? Uh, But Lynn writes in to say, it's been a long time since I watched, and you are still a loser. Appreciate you coming back, Lynn. Uh, Joy, also coming back, says she used to live here for years and years now, lives out of state. She's back. She turned on the program, enjoyed it tonight, and she wrote in, can we take you with us to New Mexico? Joy, I'm thinking the solution to your problem and to Lynn's problem might be the same thing, if you know what I'm saying. See you next time.